Hello everyone, I'm Hello everyone, I'm Don Rissmiller. I do economic research at Strategus and I'm the GIC Chair Emeritus. I am here to moderate our economic outlook panel. We're going to cover the US, we're going to cover Europe, we're going to cover Asia. So let me call to the stage Megan Green, who's a senior fellow at the Harvard Kennedy School. Let me call John Sylvia, who is the chief economist of Dynamic Economic Strategy. And let me call Michael Drury, who's the chief economist of McBain Trading and also the GIC Vice Chair of International Programs, as well as uh, Chair Emeritus. And I'll turn the floor over to John Sylvia to kick off with the U.S. So before I uh, go through my brief presentation, which, which is available to anyone who wants to talk to Lexi or Jill, you can get a copy of the slides so you don't need to copy them all. But I was quietly enjoying the morning this morning, uh, walking over to breakfast, and I was interrupted by this voice from Western Pennsylvania who informed me that if I had to wear a tie, then I had to wear a hat. <laughs> uh, so that's the proper attire. Um, I am reminded uh, this morning of uh, a scene from Casablanca. As a boy from Boston, when one reads business attire, one puts on a tie. In the, in the movie Casablanca, there's a scene between Rick and Renault in which Renault asks Rick, um, why did you come to Casablanca? And Rick replies, well, it's for my health in the waters. And uh, of course, Rick replies, I mean, Renault replies, um, this is the desert, there are no waters. And then Rick responds, I was misinformed. <laughs> so for me, I was a little bit misinformed about business attire. Uh, for a little bit of fun, uh, with respect and a little bit of, I guess, uh, frustration, I will take uh, the uh, over on the unemployment rate of 4% uh, by Mr. Evans for 2022. I will think you, you will have higher than 4% by the mid-year when we return here next year, and we'll have higher than 4% at the end of next year, and we'll go through some reasons for that. I also take the over on core inflation. Um, he talks about 2.1%. Um, I will take the over on that as well. Um, so when we meet next year, we'll have some benchmark in which to talk about. Um, I'm also a little angry with respect to a comment on immigration. Because to me, um, this is George Orwell Animal Farm. Some are more equal than others. Somehow, if you come from Mexico, Guatemala, or El Salvador, you can get in. But if you come from Cuba, you can't. Well, if you want to make the case for immigration, then everybody has to be welcome. Sorry, you can't be picking and choosing like that. So to me, I was not happy with that comment overall. So just a, a little bit of what's going on. So do we have, is the first slide up? Okay, great. Got it. Uh, that's the last slide. Yeah, all the way back. Excellent, keep going. Good. All right, so let's try this. No. So, I'll probably need to hit the other button, the down button. This one. That's what I did. I'm assuming so. This one. Let's try the other one. I guess it's Okay. So if we do this. Tell you what you do. Um, let him control. Okay. You just, just lost it. You guys. You go, Jake. We'll do that. 
All right, next slide. All right, so basically what I do is I, I talk to some people and we try to make the focus really simple. So here are four leading economic indicators that I follow as telling me where the economy is going. And once again, a comment came up yesterday that well, there was so much e economic information out there, what do you do? And the first thing you want to do as an investor is you want to look to the future. Simple as that. So these are leading economic indicators. I don't really care about existing home sales. I don't care about new home sales. I don't care about housing starts, but I do care about building permits. That's the leading economic indicator. So these are the ones that I follow on a regular basis. Um, jobless claims continue to improve. Those of you that saw this morning's numbers know that the four-week moving average for both initial and continuing jobless claims uh, moved down. Comes out every Thursday morning, Eastern Time, uh, 8.30, and you can follow that. Housing permits are slowing down, but still positive. Non-defense capital goods orders, ex-aircraft, continue to improve, and consumer sentiment is definitely up, as well as the small business survey, NFIB survey. So those are four simple indicators, all public information. Every one of you can have someone on your staff get that information each month as it comes out and gives you an indicator of where the, the, the economy is going. Next slide, please. So this is a question on supply. Um, yes, there are reopening pressures, uh, airfares, rental cars, hotels. There are bottlenecks uh, with chips, energy, energy, the shutdown of the pipeline. Um, Europe is still closed. That's going to make a difference, I think, in gas prices. And hiring workers, uh, again, as President Evans mentioned, a huge mismatch. And for those of you that had an opportunity to see earlier this week the article on Driggs, which is just up the road, there it is in the Wall Street Journal, they're covering Driggs, Idaho, and they're talking about the mismatch between workers and jobs. So, but to me, inflation's more broad-based. Um, someone asked me last night what I thought about transitory. I said it's nonsense. This is not transitory. Um, this, is, this is a lot of inflation in the pipeline, and we'll see some data on that. But if you're looking at a weaker dollar, import prices are up. If you look at the New York Fed underlying inflation gauge, it certainly is up. Um, I think a lot is happening there. A question on supply bottlenecks. The next slide, please. Um, talk a lot about job openings exceeding the number of unemployed, uh, but the quits rate is up. So people are quitting and going to a new job. But that openings and the unemployed tells you there's a lot of dislocation. And when you look at some of the data, and again, we talked a little bit about commercial real estate yesterday. When you look at the apartment and office and retail vacancy rates in San Francisco and New York and Los Angeles, they're below where they were pre-COVID. It tells you that the jobs are not in the downtown area. They're someplace else. But you get a lot of people living in the downtown area. And so once again, you get this situation, there's a huge dislocation. Comment uh, Congressman Ryan made um, is reinforced. The pay is generous, the work non-existent. It's not just the supplemental benefits that we're talking about. There are federal supplements, yes, but there are health care benefits, child care benefits. If you're unemployed, you're getting a lot of money in some cases. In fact, in some states, the total benefits exceed the median household income in that state. So there's a huge incentive to remain unemployed for a longer period of time. Now, to me as an economist, the great irony is, that's great, you can stay unemployed for a long period of time, but what do we know? The longer you're unemployed, the more likely you're gonna stay unemployed for a longer period of time, all right? Basically, you're sinking your own ship. Instead of taking that job and getting out there and getting into the labor force, you're staying home, you're playing your video games, and you're sinking your own ship. And that's, I think, a long-term challenge. Do I think job growth will surprise on the upside? Yes, because I think labor force participation rates will improve overall. Next slide, transitory inflation. No way. I'm sorry. Um, it, first, it's not the intent of the Fed to have transitory inflation. They want higher inflation. We went from the core PCE deflator, the Fed's target, 1.7% in 2019. They want 2% in 2022. 
They want 2.1% in 2023. They do not want transitory inflation. They want higher inflation. I think that's really key. When you look at the NFIB survey, 43% uh, of the firms plan to increase prices. That's higher or at least as high as October 1979. Some of us around here remember October 1979. Uh, it wasn't a pleasant time. Uh, I think that's really key. Also, I will take issue with the whole thing on consumer expectations on inflation. Um, the New York Fed consumer expectations on inflation um, um, is much higher than what it was before. This is the New York Fed. This is not some goofball organization in the middle of the country no one's ever heard of. This is the Fed telling me that consumer expectations on inflation are higher. Do not tell me they are unanchored. They are unanchored. They are unanchored. They are not anchored. So I think, again, um, not at all happens. And then the final point that, again, came up yesterday. All we're looking at, and this is the air, airplane pilot argument, all we're looking at is consumer prices. That's our judge for inflation. Okay, why don't we look at home prices? All right? Another great article, Wall Street Journal, Ketchum, Idaho, talking about home prices. All right? We got home prices. We got commodity prices. We got equity prices. We get inflation a lot of different places. And it's broader than just the consumer. But if all we're doing as an aircraft pilot is looking at consumer prices, then we're getting a lot of other problems out of the way. Sometimes you're always surprised when your wife likes to watch a program like aircraft, air, air, airplane disasters. You think, how is this possibly useful for me as an economist? But then you realize quickly that focus on one thing uh, I think is really uh, key. Um, I think also the subsequent argument about treasury yields is totally misplaced. For those of us in the business, and maybe Jim will have a different view, when you break down treasury yields, the break-even 10-year treasury is down just 14 basis points. All that other decline has to do with an assessment on the real economy. So I think it's important when you look at treasury yields to break it down and to argue that you have lower treasury yields, so therefore inflation is not a problem. No, no, no. You have lower treasury yields because people don't believe the economic growth numbers, that they expect things to sl slow down. And the Delta variant, I think, may be part of that story. Next slide, please. So employee unit labor costs have been rising over the last few years. That is a direct feed into the CPI. So I think there's an upward pressure there. Next slide, please. Uh, the Canadian dollar uh, really has helped keep uh, our numbers lower over time. So one thing about economics that is really important, there is a lot of interactions between sectors. So again, the, the argument that somehow yields just reflect inflation is totally nonsense. Interest rates reflect expectations for growth, expectations for the exchange rate, and again, uh, the, the flow of information going forward. So what is my future direction for interest rates and the dollar? I do expect that uh, our interest rates will continue to go up. Uh, current treasury rates are being suppressed by Fed buying. I think, again, it's so disingenuous, all right? Treasury rates are down, this, that, the other thing. Okay, but Fed buying of U.S. Treasury rates is now 22%. That's up significantly from a year ago. So when the demand for one type of asset goes up, yeah, the price has gone down, all right? It's not just interest rates in isolation. So I think that is really key. I do think you're going to have a weaker dollar over time. Uh, the DXY in the last year is down 4%. Um, that's made a difference overall. And with respect to the unemployment rate, uh, there, there was a comment um, by President Williams that uh, we're not going to change anything until we reachieve uh, where we were before. And in fact, we're going to do something even better. Um, again, read the Wall Street Journal article. Uh, jobs lost may not come back. Yeah, a lot of those jobs are not coming back. They're structurally unemployed people, and you will have a higher persistent unemployment rate over time. But for me, the problem is, wait a minute. If the Fed is saying they want to get back to 3.9%, and nothing shows that we get back to 3.9% in the next two years, 
then I have a Fed that's going to stay easy. If I have a Fed that's going to stay easy in an economy that's growing as well as it is, even if it slows down a little bit, I'm going to have a heck of a lot more inflation. Right? I don't have lower inflation. I'm going to have higher inflation. So if I'm an investor, I sure as heck are not going to buy Treasury bonds. And we can talk about that in a minute. Um, next slide, please. And next slide. And this is the yield curve. Uh, an increase in a yield curve does have an increase in profit margins. So that is positive for corporate profits going forward if the 10-year rate rises. Uh, next slide, please. So the question on the investment outlook. Yeah, I, I still think you have to be in risky assets. I think you still have to be in equities. You still have to be in high-yield, high-grade bonds. Uh, again, one of the great challenges. High-yield bonds now yield less than the rate of inflation. Now, come on. I mean, somebody who'd been around in the 1990s and 2000s, who would ever have thought that the high-yield bond would yield less than the rate of inflation? I, I think that is absolutely key. I think another thing to think about, in the first half of this year, the total return on every government ETF and mutual fund was negative. All right? So for those of you that have 40% of your portfolio in government bonds, you lost money. You are now poor. Congratulations. And that was before taxes and before inflation. So I think you've got a real challenge when you think about this 60-40 split in terms of your portfolio and how you, how you look at things. Um, I think, in, again, in the emerging markets, another article in the FT today talked about the difficulty of emerging markets in the current scenario. Um, commercial real estate, migration and job patterns. Again, I'll refer to the articles about Driggs and Ketchum. Uh, demographics are uh, amazing. Electoral College, Montana gets an extra vote. Who would have thought that Montana would actually get an electrical vote? An, another vote. It, it was amazing. But you look at it and you think about it. Florida and North Carolina get an extra vote. Okay, that's not surprising. Texas gets two. Not surprising. What is interesting to me, because I live in Florida, Florida now has more electoral votes than New York. You think about that for a minute. Florida now has more electoral votes than New York. Thank you very much. Because all my neighbors are from someplace up north. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, it's always fascinating. Next slide, please. Debt ratio. Uh, yes, increases in a debt ratio does tend to lower real final sales. And then finally, the question on federal deficits. Um, there is no free lunch. I don't believe in MMT. That's a joke, okay? Uh, so I don't buy that nonsense. And I think what you need to think about is where you are and where you're going. The starting point, we started out with low interest rates, low inflation, and excess savings. So welcome John Law and Louis XIV, okay? But what do we know about what happened with John Law? Well, he did it, and then he did it again, and then he did it for a third time. And what happened? All right, well, he bankrupted the central bank. Inflation skyrocketed. Currency was worthless. He ran out of the country, and he executed Louis XVI. Okay? I'm sorry. In the short run, you can pretty much get, rid, get, get away with anything. In the long run, you cannot. And so for me, I expect higher interest rates, lower economic growth, and depreciating dollar. As I said yesterday, there was a great research piece done by a lady out of the New York Fed years ago. And she said, basically, when the deficits get out of control, it happens one of, one of four way impacts. Either you have slower growth, and again, you think about it. You get all these extra deficits, it's all wonderful. But look at Biden's budget numbers. What does he say about economic growth in 2023 to 2025, 2026? It's less than 2%. Okay. You got more deficits, you got more debt, and you have slower growth. How are you going to pay for this? All right? Well, you're going to print more money. All right? Well, that's going to get you higher inflation. You're going to have higher interest rates. And then going back to Congressman Ryan's point, now you have a threat about the dollar as a reserve currency. Um, again, you know, this, this combination of the CBO estimates of rising deficits and debt combined with also the CBOs, but also the Biden administration's estimate of slower growth, I think is, is really difficult. I think so far, a lot of our spending has put fingers in the dike, but we haven't built a better dike. We haven't built a bigger dike. 
and I think long run we have a lot of issues. Uh, we've seen this in Greece and Argentina and the UK and France. In the short run you can get away with things, in the long run you can't. So final slide, uh, I mean, one more, I'm sorry. Nothing permanent but change. That's absolutely important. Things are changing. And unfortunately for many of you, over the next five to ten years, you will end up with more people in Wyoming, more people in Idaho, more people in Montana. And you're going to wonder, why are all these people here? Well, <laughs> there's a reason for that. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, John. We'll go to Megan next. Great, thanks. Um, I'm going to offer a different perspective on the whole inflation debate and then talk a bit about Europe and emerging markets all in five to ten minutes. Thank you, okay. Okay. Yeah. Oh, there we go, great. Um, I'll start off though by um, highlighting some recent research that just came out looking at the inflation forecasting records of Fed officials, Wall Street economists, fund managers, and traders. Um, and it turns out we're all equally crap at this. Um, so I think we all need humility on the inflation debate. And we're undergoing a massive economic experiment in the US. So that makes it even harder. Um, but I am going to say that this debate about inflation uh, reflects a huge schism within economics. Um, I, I stole this chart from my boss, Larry Summers. Um, and I would say he's an old school economist. And old school economists, and most economists, frankly, have learned that the economy has this equilibrium, that it has a single equilibrium, potential growth. And it kind of oscillates around that equilibrium. The role of policy is to go ahead and nudge the economy back towards that equilibrium. Um, and so when you go into a recession, you figure out how far we are from that equilibrium, um, how big a hole we've fallen down, that's the output gap. And then the role of policy is to, to measure, you know, take a bunch of measures, figure out the multipliers, and basically fill that hole perfectly. So if you believe in this view of the world, um, then you're looking at the output gap, and you can see it in this chart, um, and you're looking at the size of the fiscal stimulus that has already been legislated for the U.S., so that's not including the American uh, Families or Jobs Plans. And your hair is on fire because you're saying, oh my God, not only have we filled the hole, we've completely overfilled it. And that, we learned in Econ 101 decades ago, means that you, have, you overheat the economy and you have an acceleration of inflation. Um, it turns out that I've, I've spent a lot of time talking to epidemiologists, physicists, other hard scientists over the past year in particular, and it turns out that economics is literally the only science that still believes in a single equilibrium. And it's baked into all of our models. Every other science believes in multiple equilibria. And so if you believe in multiple equilibria, not that there's one kind of long-term uh, plane that the economy can be on, but there are many actually then the role of policy isn't just to nudge the economy back towards that single equilibrium, it's to fundamentally prevent the economy from dropping to a much lower one. In this instance, you know, for example, labor market scarring and hysteresis setting in and dropping the economy to a lower plane, or to fundamentally jump the economy up to a much higher plane. And in that case, you look at the output gap and think it's kind of irrelevant, it doesn't matter. Um, and so all this fiscal stimulus that we're providing and will provide when new legislation is passed, whatever it contains, it, it probably won't really be an issue for overheating the economy or driving inflation up. And so what you think about inflation very much depends on which school you fit into. You can probably guess which one I fit into. Um, I actually don't think that we need to worry about sustained inflation. We have inflation, there's no question. We all should have expected it. That was, that was always gonna happen. The question is, will it become a spiral um, and how long will that be sustained? Um, John actually mentioned that this is the NFIB survey asking companies what their biggest problems were. And John mentioned, and you've all seen it in headlines, that companies are having trouble finding workers. Um, that's the green line, the quality of work workers. Um, everyone forgets that companies had trouble finding workers before the virus even hit, though. In fact, more companies were arguing that they couldn't find workers before in late 2019 than they are now. And we didn't really get a wage spiral in 2019. So I'm not sure that we should assume that because we're, we're seeing this become a problem again, uh, we will get a wage spiral this time around. And it's really hard to get an inflation spiral, impossible, I would say, without a wage spiral. 
Um, I think John also mentioned, this is just looking at the, um, you know, what firms plan on doing, whether they're going to raise prices or raise wages. They say far and away that they're going to raise prices, and yes, that's inflationary, but again, that doesn't really feed into a wage spiral, and that's what you need to have a sustained inflation spiral. So I think we should be less worried about that. We would be more worried if these two lines were reversed. Um, also, in terms of consumer expectations for what will happen to their weight, uh, their income, um, we can see that you know consumers are have been expecting wages to rise more so than those expecting them to fall. That makes total sense, but we're actually pretty far off of historical trends. So they're still pretty low, which again suggests, yeah, even if consumers are expecting that they're going to have higher wages, um, it's it's not off the charts anything to worry about at this point. Um, and I will also point out uh, quickly that if, if you look in structural terms, there are all these massive drivers that have been um, driving low wages for the past couple of decades. They include an increase in market concentration, so superstar firms, a, a fall in uh, worker power, deunionization in the US, um, globalization, which many people, there's a narrative that we've all stepped back from globalization. South Korean exports, a great bellwether of globalization, have hit record highs again. So I think that narrative might not be quite right. Digitalization, automation, all of these things have been accelerated during this crisis, and they're all driving lower wages. So if you look at structural factors, then actually you just think, you know, our wages are going to be even lower, not, not much higher. So there, there are all kinds of supply and demand constraints that are causing higher inflation. Will that last? If you look at the structural drivers, I would argue they wouldn't. Um, also, inflation expectations, both for consumers and for investors, are pretty well anchored. So. Uh, for consumers, we just look at the University of Michigan survey, and sure, inflation expectations in the next year are elevated, but if you look at inflation expectations five years from now, they're much lower. The same exact things goes for Wall Street economists, so uh, or investors, rather, and so inflation expectations are higher over the next year, and five years, not so much. So that suggests that inflation expectations aren't becoming unanchored, which is you know the Fed's worst nightmare, and that's when you do start to worry about sustained inflation. They're still anchored. Everyone thinks, yeah, we have inflation now, but in a couple of years' time, actually, it'll probably drop um, further towards the Fed's target. And then we also need to think about how broad-based inflation has been. There's been a huge increase in used car prices and airfares, for example, um, commodities as well. Um, but some of these are really coming off. So the chart on the left just th shows Brent crude, um, industrial commodities, the cost to freight from China to the US, um, and then ISM supplier backlogs. And you can see that they've been rising for a couple months now, but they've actually leveled off. Um, so that's the beginning of an indication that this might not be sustained. And then the chart on the right just shows a couple of commodities, in particular industrial metals, metals lumber, and copper. And they've also um, tailed off and are stabilizing. So again, everybody's been worried these things are driving inflation higher. Do we need to worry about them being sustained? I think actually some of the data is already starting to turn, though it's early days. So there are certainly good arguments for why we have inflation, for sure. I think all economists can agree on that. There are good arguments for why we might need to worry about it being sustained, but I think there's a lot of evidence suggesting that actually this really might be transitory. Charlie Evans was right, um, and we don't need to worry about this so much. Um, I'm going to shift here to talk about Europe a little bit. Um, so I'm actually really bullish on Europe. Sorry, I need to go back a slide. Thanks. Thanks, Eric. Um, <laughs> I'm really bullish on Europe, which like no one has ever heard me say ever. So it's not in my nature to be bullish, honestly. Uh, but I am pretty bullish on Europe. Um, this is just a chart showing a whole bunch of combined surveys. Um, mainly it's, it's gauging business um, confidence, but also some PMI data for the Eurozone, for the EU, for the UK. Um, sadly, I have to separate those out now that the UK has left. But you can see that they're all growing. Um, the PMI data is all in expansionary territory. So the data is looking good as economies are opening up. Um, also, a couple months ago, the EU vaccination effort was a disaster, but they're catching up pretty quickly. So their vaccination rate in the EU is much faster than ours in the UK and the US, um, largely because we were faster. So now we're having to convince people to get vaccines, whereas um, supply is still the constraint in the EU. But that suggests that economies should continue to open up. Um, there is a real worry in terms of southern European countries who are really reliant on tourism um, for growth. So it's, it's about a fifth 
of um, the, the economy for Spain, Italy, Portugal, and Greece. And I just pinched this chart for Morgan Stanley, but they did a study showing how much a bad outcome of the Delta variant, which is ripping through Europe, um, could really impact growth. And it could be between one and a half to two and a half percentage points off GDP in the next year. That's pretty extreme. And so I think that is a reason for caution. Um, I think France is also um, pretty vulnerable given how high their vaccine hesitancy is. Um, Eastern European countries are also vulnerable as a result. Um, those who are Europe bulls will highlight that um, good news is, is that fiscal help is coming. So most of the fiscal response has been at the national level. But a year ago, roughly, the EU got together and put together this massive fund where they agreed to issue debt together, which is huge, huge politically in particular. And then they would give out some of that money as grants to countries, and they would give some of it out as loans. And so that money should actually start flowing later this month, which is exciting. Um, so national responses have been more constrained in Europe than they have been in the US, particularly in Southern Europe, where they haven't had much room to go ahead and borrow. Um, now European money is coming down the line, um, but I do think there's a reason to worry that actually that money won't be put to use. So EU countries get money from Europe all the time. They're called structural funds, um, and it turns out they're really bad at actually spending it. So on average, they spend less than 50% of the money that they get from Brussels. Um, Italy spends um, on average 39% of what they get, uh, and, and Spain is even worse, it's around 33%. So they're getting lots of money, but are they gonna be able to absorb it? Unfortunately, kind of bureaucratic processes and red tape make it much harder for them to absorb. So you can see um, the two lower lines, blue and orange, show um, the rate at which uh, they have actually managed to spend the last round of EU money that they got in a seven-year budgetary process. Um, and, and the yellow and gray lines, I believe, are the, are the rate at which they're assuming they'll be able to absorb the new money coming, which you can see is way faster, and there's really no reason to believe that any country in the EU can do this. So I'm generally bullish, but I think a lot of people are really excited about this money coming from Europe, and I'll say I think they're going to spend much less of it than everyone expects. And then I'll just finish on one point on emerging markets. Um, no one's really being wor been worried about emerging markets as emerging markets have been able to issue tons of debt. And capital, f capital flew way out of emerging markets incredibly abruptly in March 2020, but since then has been flowing into emerging markets. That kind of papers up any issues. Um, the chart on the left just shows that debt burdens have risen significantly as a percentage of G D GDP in EM. EM is the um, orange line. That was already a problem before the pandemic hit, so you can imagine they've just ramped up borrowing in order to respond to the virus. Um, and if you're looking in sovereign debt terms, if you're looking for weaknesses, you look at um, kind of public debt, overall government debt, but then you also look at external debt. And that's what's reflected in the chart on the right. Um, the actually external balances across EM look much better than they have before previous sovereign debt crises. Um, and so you, the black dots suggest that these big three emerging market countries, South Africa, Chile, and Brazil, just by way of example, are actually in, in surplus now. So that's much better than we've seen in the past. That could change really quickly if the dollar appreciates. A lot of these countries not only have borrowed in dollars, and so, but are service it in their local currencies so if the dollar appreciates it it becomes much harder for them to service their debt but they also invoice a lot of their trade in dollars so if they're importing um, and they've invoiced it in dollars but they're paying it in local currency it becomes a problem for them if the dollar appreciates um, and also if uh, you know US interest rates start to rise or borrowing costs in the US start to rise then emerging market um, borrowing costs also start to rise. So it's, it's not inconceivable that this could reverse really quickly. And I highlight it because um, we don't have the tools to deal with an emerging market sovereign debt crisis. Um, the IMF is kind of the player that's meant to step in when that happens. The IMF has really, really good programs for complete basket case countries that desperately need help and they have to sign up to all these conditions in order to get aid and no country really wants to do that. But if they're in really bad shape, they have to. And then on the other hand, the IMF has really good programs for countries that have a pristine policy record um, and are just having a bit of trouble and need some bridge lending to get through it. Um, but they've got nothing for countries in the middle, and that's where all these countries are going to fall, I think, if we do um, see interest rates rise in the U.S. eventually and countries start to get into trouble. And then you end up having sort of cascading 
um, sovereign debt restructurings um, and lost decades as we've seen in the past. So it's a risk no one's really worried about right now, but it, looking forward a couple of years, I think we need to start thinking about it. I'll finish my comments there. Thank you very much, Megan. And we will turn the floor over to Michael. So I'm, I'm gonna do this uh, really quick and from here so that there's a chance we'll get some questions in. Uh, the outlook on China, China just announced its numbers last night for what that's worth. They said that they grew 7.9%, which means they're up 5.5% over the last two years, which is slightly slower than the 6% they had planned on growing, and they were on a downward trend. So they're not far off from where they expected to be, very much like the United States, which is expected to return to trend at, by the end of this year. Uh, the issue is that they didn't do it the way they thought they were going to do it. I mean, if you look at their internal data, their retail sales are up 4.9% on a two-year basis, so slower than they had hoped it would be. Their output is up 6%, their industrial production is up 6% on a two-year basis, pretty much in line where they thought it would be. Their exports are up 11.9% on a two-year basis, because that's what's driving it. The reopening of the United States and now the reopening of Europe is generating strong demand for Chinese uh, product and they're manufacturing it and they're exporting it. They're exporting it at inflated prices because the yuan appreciated during the COVID period and because shipping costs of everything are through the roof because there's such strong demand for Chinese supply that you can't get ships to where they're supposed to be. You can't get boxes to where they're supposed to be. There's no fre air freight to replace it. There's not many alternatives. So we've got a China that's existing on very strong export sales. They're not happy about it. So they're watching their domestic economy, if you believe their numbers, and you know, I'll put them within a skosh. It suggests that their domestic economy, or excuse me, their total economy, grew about 3% in the first half of the year, and almost all of that was export growth. So their domestic economy didn't grow at all. China was the first one to say that it was gonna start tightening at the beginning of this year, and that was taken as a challenge to the rest of the world. Now they've reduced their reserve requirement and they're starting to show signs that they're easing because it looks like their domestic economy has come to a, a complete halt. China's in a very important year for them. This is their centenary year of the party. They just held a, uh, a big uh, round of speeches where Xi Jinping said, I'm the man, you can't bully me, China's where it's going, all that kind of stuff, everything you'd expect from essentially the State of the Union address. They have the Olympics coming up in, uh, in February of next year. They're not going to allow their economy to slow down and they're not gonna do anything stupid between now and the Olympic Games. They've got enough on their table between now and then. What do I mean by they're not going to do anything stupid? Well, the real risk in China right now is that they appreciate their currency to make a run at becoming the reserve currency of the world. This month, China became the largest trade partner with the EU. The United States is now only the largest trade partner with Canada and Mexico. China is the largest trade partner with every other nation on earth, many of whom hate their guts. And that's the way things go. You hate your boss's guts, but he's still your boss, and you still got to deal with the way he wants to do things. And that's where China is right now. And they've taken advantage of COVID to ramp up their, their advantage in many areas. Uh, so now the question is, the biggest question with China is, what happens in Hong Kong? That's over. What happens in Taiwan? That's just starting. And the challenge for the United States and for Biden coming off of, you know, as uh, Congressman Ryan, Speaker Ryan said, you know, Biden's a little less clumsy, but pretty much on the same path with China as, as Trump was. The real question for him is not what the Democrats think versus the Republicans. They all hate China. The problem is what the multinationals think versus what the politicians think. And the multinationals all love China. There's an article on the front page of the South China Morning Post today arguing that AmCham China, which is the American companies doing business in China, doesn't agree with the Biden administration's policies. Why? They want access to the fastest growing markets on earth. So the challenge is not politically inside the United States. It's between the United States companies domiciled in the United States and their activities in China. You all saw you know, uh, Elon Musk praise China. 
Why? Because his biggest plant and his biggest customers in China. This is the real challenge. China's taking advantage of that, and Taiwan is the biggest target right now because Xi Jinping said it was his biggest target. It was his daddy's biggest target. It's his biggest target. Will the Chinese just go in and take over Taiwan? I doubt it. They have cyber warfare. They have currency warfare. They have a lot of other uh, things that they can do. But given what's happened in Tibet, given what's happened with the Uyghurs, given what's happened in Hong Kong, what's happened in Macau, Taiwan's next on the list, and they will slowly, incrementally ramp up the pressure. From a Chinese point of view, Taiwan is a heads-I-win, tails-you-lose situation. Why? Because the biggest problem for China with the rest of the world right now is they don't trust the United States on technology. After ZTE and Huawei, they think that the Americans are out to keep them from advancing to their role as the greatest nation on Earth. Doesn't matter whether we agree with that or not, they agree to that especially at the top echelons of the party inside China. So their policy is set on the basis of we need self-sufficiency, so we need to promote our own domestic internal technology. Well, that'll take a decade at best. Or we need to advance quicker by taking over Taiwan. Well, Taiwan already belongs to them in the Chinese mindset. There's papers signed in almost every country in the world, except I think Guatemala, that says that Taiwan is part of China. The United States is the only country that's really backing up hard on that. Uh, so the question is, what do they do to take it over? Well, they want to take it over because TC TSMC is the largest advanced semiconductor manufacturer in the world, and they want that technology. They're getting some of it. I mean, there's plenty of espionage. There's plenty of uh, Taiwanese companies operating in China already. But the, the issue is either they get that technology or in the process of failing to get it, they deny it to everyone else. They could just bomb Taiwan into the ground in about five minutes. And then where would you get your advanced semiconductor chips from? So from China's point of view, the question is, are the wolf warriors who would bomb Taiwan into the ground in charge or are there more rational people in charge? None of that happens until after the Olympics. But after the Olympics, Taiwan is going to be a growing friction point between the United States and China. And China is going to be using the fact that it's the largest trade partner in the world to try to put its point of view across to its major trade partners. How's that all work out? I don't really know. But I'm telling you, it's not going to happen with lower prices if you're fighting with the guy who produces the, the majority of your imported goods. And he's trying to strengthen his currency in, at the, in the meantime. So among the many reasons for higher inflation in the United States, friction between the United States and China should be very high on the list. And it's nothing that we can do anything about. It's entirely up to their point of view about how they're going to handle that situation. So that was quick. I'll answer lots of questions at lunch, or we can take a couple now. schedule, so we'll just take one question, uh, if there's one from the audience before we uh, head for a break. I, I have one question. Who's right on inflation? <laughs> <laughs> well, if there are no questions, we are, oh, there's one in the front here. Just a very quick one from Megan, because I was intrigued by your comments on Europe. You're the first person I've hear, heard be bullish on Europe in quite some time, and I'd, I'd love you just to quickly expand on that. Yeah, sure. So, I mean, it, it, Europe is six months behind us in many ways um, in terms of growth. Um, it's further behind us in terms of inflation. Um, but they are reopening. Their, their vaccination is now going really well. Um, and so you are seeing all these econo economic indicators pick up. Um, they're getting money coming down the line, so there's more fiscal stimulus um, in the pipes. A lot of it is, you know, they describe it to me as free money from heaven um, because a lot of it is just grants. They don't have to pay it back ever. Um, and I said, you know, they're not great at absorbing money from Europe. There are reasons to be a little bit more optimistic um, than what we've seen in the past with structural funds. In, with structural funds, they have to co-finance part of it, and the weaker countries often can't afford it. Um, the structural funds are often administered by local governments, whereas 
every single country in the EU has put a, you know, set up a dedicated team to come up with plans to use this money um, and go ahead and implement it. So there are reasons to hope that they've picked projects they know they can actually do um, and we'll be able to implement it uh, more uh, uh, effectively. Um, and the money ends. There's a very, with the structural funds, there's actually a grace period. So if you don't spend it in time, you get a three more years. Um, this money ends um, at the end of 2026, that's it. And so there is a real incentive for them to use it and they have to use part of it for digitalization and for climate change. Um, so. Uh, there are some medium to long term um, interests in that. So I, I think uh, Europe is looking at much more. If you gave me, it depends on your time frame. Um, I would also wager that there will be another sovereign debt crisis in Europe in like eight to 10 years. But if that's not your time frame, if it's shorter, I think Europe is looking up. Thank you, Megan. Thank you, John. Thank you, Michael. Please uh, join me. Uh, a round of applause.